But the big thing that is that is that uh, Heisenberg uncertainty per, uh, principle. So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle looks like this. This is the mathematical way of writing it. Uh, P, where X is the position and P is momentum. And these two sigmas represent uncertainty. Just like uncertainty, like we talked about in a measurement, the uncertainty in, in a particle's position times the uncertainty in a particle's momentum always has to be greater than, actually, sorry, I switched this. The uncertainty will always be greater than this constant. This is the same H that's present in that, in the um, lab from yesterday, where you just, the energy of a photon equals H times the frequency. This is one of those fundamental constants of the universe that, that led Einstein and um, Stephen Hawking and many others to think that there's probably some unifying theory that that um, links all of these forces together is one of the reasons why is because H shows up everywhere. H shows up everywhere and we don't quite know why other than there's similar physical properties everywhere in the universe. Um, but what this is really saying in everyday terms is you can't know both where something is and how fast it's going at the same time. The uncertainty, these uncertainties being inversely proportional means if you, if the uncertainty is really, really low here, that means this uncertainty has to be really, really big. Right? And so H is a really, really small number to the point that for the most part, um, if it's a large enough, large enough object that we can actually measure how much it weighs, then this doesn't really apply. But when you get down to something that's the size of an electron, the momentum of an electron is small enough because its mass is so small that this winds up being important. And we can't know both where it is and it's how fast and how fast it's going at the same time. And you can kind of make sense of that a little bit in terms of um, in, in other sciences and other disciplines it's known as the observer effect. The act of observing something or measuring something changes that system. So if you think about how small an electron is, if you're trying to measure where an electron is, how would you do that? How do you measure where something is visually? You look at it, right? What is that really doing? You're measuring photons bouncing off of something and then hitting your eye, right? Well, what if the thing that the photons are bouncing off of is so small that the photon hitting it causes it to move? So I want you to picture hanging a, a baseball from a, a rope in the middle of the class, a string from the ceiling. And then I'm going to put a blindfold on and I'm going to try to find that baseball by throwing golf balls. How am I going to know if I hit it? Be able to hear it, right? But as soon as I hit it, I know where it was a second ago, but what happened? There's now it's moving, right? Or if I know how fast it's going, I can't know where it is at any given point, like a plane propeller. We can measure how fast that plane propeller is spinning and have an idea of how many rotations per second it's having, but we don't know exactly where it is at any point in there, right? So electrons behave that same way. And that's the whole point of the Schrodinger of Schrodinger's cat is the idea that you can't know everything about the system. So until you measure it, it's you all you have to go on is probability. And so you just treat it like the probability. If the probabilities are equal, both states are true at the same time. There's a 50-50 shot that I flip a coin and it comes up heads, but you don't know. I flip it and I just cover it. Is it heads or tails? It's both until we check it. And then that changes the probability. The act of checking if it's heads or tails causes they call it, causes the wave function to collapse. When you're treating everything like it's a probability, you can represent it as a series of probabilities. 
And we call that at the wave function, which is the Greek letter psi. Um, the Greek letter, this, and it's PSI. Um, the wave function is a collection of all the probabilities about that particle or about that system at a given time. And we're, we're going to treat them like they're all true until we measure. And then we don't really have a wave function anymore because it's not probability. As soon as we actually measure it, we know where it is. And so now we know what the outcome is. It's no longer a probability. It's one function that says it's here. But then other functions wind up getting larger. All right, so it's, it's really hard, it turns out, to measure things in the quantum mechanical realm because every time you measure it, physicists have tried to get really, really clever with how they can measure these things. Every time they measure properties about the electron, they find out that they are changing something else. Um, like for instance, if you, the classic example is what's called the two slit experiment. If you shine light, say we have a, a light bulb over here and it's shining light through both of these. When the light goes through these slits, it behaves like a wave all of a sudden. And these waves can wind up interfering with each other. So instead of what we would expect from classical mechanics would be that when you shine a light on two slits, you see on the wall over here, you would see like a bar of light here and a, and a bar of light here. If light was a particle, that's how it would work, right? If you just were just standing over here and say, throwing baseball through these slits, there's gonna be like a bell curve distribution here and a bell curve distribution here, but the, for the most part, they're going to be in these two areas. Light behaves like a wave, so you actually get a bunch of different light areas over here. You get an interference pattern, which was one of the ways they proved the light was a wave. Thing is, if you do the same experiment with electrons, and now an electron is something we know is a particle, but we still get those electrons interfering with each other like they're, like they're waves. And in fact, if you send just one electron at a time through, the electrons interfere with each other. So an electron is, an, is a wave that can interfere with itself. It's not like it's two waves running into each other. The same electron is one wave that interferes with itself, which weird, right? You switch it though, you, instead of monitoring where they're hitting over here, if you actually monitor which slit they go through, all of a sudden they behave like a particle. And now they don't interfere with each other anymore. The act of measuring them forces them to behave like a particle, and now they're no longer waves. Again, just weird. Quantum mechanics is, is funny that way. None of that other than the um, Heisenberg uncertainty principle would be something I would really test you on, because I can't ask you to calculate any of this because you don't have the math. That wave function, um, every is that wave function is a matrix. Um, which, so kind of like a spreadsheet, how many of you have seen matrices in algebra two maybe? A few of you. Um, where every element in that matrix is actually a function, and that function is made up of complex numbers, meaning imaginary numbers mixed with real numbers, and there's calculus involved in all of it. So it's basically like the holy trinity of upper division math. You've got linear algebra happening, you've got multivariable calculus happening, and you've got complex analysis happening, um, all in one function. It's no wonder we can't solve these things analytically. So with that in mind, I'm not gonna ask you to calculate anything about the wave function. I just want you to be aware of it as a concept. All right, so what's the level we're actually going to approach it at? We're going to talk about it. We're going to start talking about it as the Bohr model, what we ended with the other day, where we 
we established that electrons can be in, in different energy levels, but they can't be in between those energy levels, right? They cannot exist between n equals one and n equals two. And the, they actually knew this mathematically before they could prove this. One of the reasons why the Bohr model was, was such a big breakthrough is they couldn't understand why the math was predicting what it was or how that was gonna match up to the real world until Bohr came in with, his, with this model to explain what was going on um, on the math side. Um, and basically trying to put an electron in between n equals one and n equals two is in our guitar string analogy, it's like trying to pluck a guitar string where one end of the string is not attached. What happens when you do that? No vibration, right? You can't have a vi vibration on a guitar string unless it's attached at both ends. Um, also a side note, did we talk about how small the nuclei are? I think we did, right? Maybe we used the baseball stadium analogy. No? So nucleus has pretty much all of the mass and all the protons and neutrons are in the, in the nucleus of the atom, but it's tiny. It's vo the volume of the nucleus is like if you went to a major league sta um, baseball stadium and you hold a baseball on the pitcher's mound. The baseball is the size of the nucleus. The rest of the stadium is the size of the electrons. When I say it's small, I mean like really small. Almost all of the space in an atom is made up, is taken up by the electrons. And since we also can't change anything about the nucleus, at least at this point, we're not doing nuclear reactions yet. Um, the only way we really can make these nuclei or these atoms more stable is by moving around the electrons to be in a more stable state. All right, so the Bohr models are first guess at this, where it has the different energy levels, but it turns out there are energy levels within energy levels. Basically, there's actually four different what they call quantum numbers. And those four quantum numbers are all of the characteristics of an electron that you need to say, that you need to describe its energy. And the most important of those is the principal quantum number, which we just call N. The easy way to think about principal quantum number is it's the energy level, the overall energy level. So N equals one and N equals two here. This should be lowercase, but I messed up when I made this figure. Um, Autocorrect got me, it always does that. Um, and so the, this is the sort of like the most critical part, the sort of the biggest, um, aspect of where the electron is, what energy it is. If you're talking about the quantum numbers, like, like the, your address, this is what state you're in. So the broadest, and then we zoom in from there and give it more characteristics. Um, and then there's M, and I always mix these up. It doesn't ma matter what the other ones are called um, because we're going to basically describe them and not use them as variables. Because the reason they're, they have these variables associated with them is because they actually are, are variables that fit into that complex function that I talk about in the wave function. And they're basically the numbers that you can plug in that give you a real answer when you try to do this. Um, M is what type of orbital it, or what within each energy level, there's multiple orbitals. And an orbital is basically like, what does the function look like in three dimensions? This, the most basic type of, of orbital just looks like a sphere. It's more complicated than a sphere because it actually involves, it's, um, I don't know, do I want to get into that? 
we'll get into that in a second. Um, it's basically like, like the striking the open chord or the open string on a guitar string. You get just one simple vibration up and down in the middle, right? And as we added more nodes, those higher harmonics, we got higher energy states. The different orbital types are like what type of harmonic we're talking about. As we get to higher energy orbital types, they start, they start looking more complex. So the simplest type is an S orbital. And it looks like a sphere. A P orbital is what these functions are. And they're basically a P orbital. You can think of a P orbital as being a sine, a sine wave in spherical coordinates. So if you if you think about what a sine wave does, it goes out and in or up and down, right? If you think about that instead of having it in X and Y, if you think about it and having it in um in polar coordinates, that's one of the ways that you can get like a figure eight shape on in polar coordinates. Sine wave in polar coordinates looks something like that. You do that in three dimensions, so spherical coordinates instead of polar coordinates, you get a shape that looks like this. And these P orbitals, they're like the, the first harmonic. So not just striking an open string, they're add, we added a node right in between those two colors, between those two phases. This node right here on the guitar string is where, where it switches from up and down, where there's no vibration happening. In an orbital, a node is a spot where there's zero probability of finding an electron. Basically, these, these orbital shapes are the functions that show you the probability of where you're likely to find an electron. Turns out they're actually four-dimensional, not three-dimensional, which makes it really hard. If you can visualize, um, if you can visualize taking a bell curve and saying, okay, well, there's the, at this shape where it says 2PZ, there's a 90% probability that when you find an electron, it's within this, this volume that's enclosed here. If you want 95% probability of finding them, then you have to make it bigger. So we wind up with these, these, we depict them as being these distinct shapes, but they're actually fuzzy. They're actually like a probability function overlaid on top of these three-dimensional shapes, which is hard to visualize. I get that. It's not something that our brains really have the firmware to properly think about. Uh, it takes a lot of practice, a lot of thinking about that. Um, yeah, I probably, I was probably two or three years into grad school before the first time it occurred to me to think about it that way and before I thought I really could understand what was happening a little bit. Um, so it's normal to feel like this is like, what the heck is happening? That's okay. Um, the other quantum numbers we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, there's M sub L which is basically which of these three pieces, all three of these together collectively are a P orbital. A P orbital is all three of them put together. But if you're talking about where each individual electron is likely to be found, you have to say, okay, is it in the part of the P orbital that's aligned along the Z axis? or the part of the P orbital that's aligned along the P axis, or the part of the orbital that's aligned along the X axis. So that's sort of like, if, uh, if this is state in your, in your address, this is like your zip code within the state or your town, either way, town works. And then within your town, there's different zip codes. I like that better actually. So town, zip code. And then the last one is basically, okay, if your zip code narrowed it down to 
only two houses. Let's say there's only two houses in your zip code. The last one is it house A or house B, basically. Um, and we call that spin. M sub S is spin. Um, it's not like the electrons are actually spinning, but the math for all of this, remember that, we, that I mentioned these functions are in spherical coordinates. And they're like sine waves. So there's rotational aspects to it. And anytime you have rotation, you have two different directions something could rotate. And if I was going to spin a basketball on my finger, I could spin it clockwise or counterclockwise. And I could get the same amount of energy in the ball either way. But it's not the exact same state, right? Because one of them is rotating the opposite direction as the other. So we call it spin because mathematically it kind of looks like the similar math to a, a sphere spinning. It's not actually spinning, um, which leads to the, you know, the, the physicist theme. Spin is just like a ball spinning, except it's not a ball and it's not spinning. And it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but if you trust me that the mathematical equations behind these functions look a lot like the math behind something spinning in a rotate in a um, spherical coordinates. All right, so how do we determine where we're likely to find so called um, those? P sub Z, P sub Y, P sub X, we call those suborbitals. So you've got energy levels, then you've got orbitals, and then you've got suborbitals, and then you've got spin. Put all that together, that gives you the address for, for an electron. Where are you going to find the electron in the system? So how do we figure out what states we're likely to find electrons in? Well, in general, we find electrons in the most stable states. So there's a couple of rules that we can use to figure out how do we add electrons to the system that are basically just, these are the rules to follow to get the lowest energy state, that what we call the ground state. The ground state is the lowest possible energy state, which is usually where you're most likely to find the electrons, right? If we take the ground state and we shine light on it, we can promote an electron like we talked about on Wednesday, right? Then it's not the ground state anymore. Now it's the excited state. So these rules that we're going to go through are the rules for assigning where you're going to put your electrons in the ground state. And when you put all of them together, you get what's called the electron configuration, which is where all the electrons are that you're likely to find or where you're most likely to find them in a, in a, a uh, system. So the, the simplest idea has a complicated name. I guess it's complicated if you don't speak German. Uh, do I have any German speakers that I already asked that? Anybody speak German in here? Wonderful. Nobody's going to correct my pronunciation then. Um, so the German word for this is Aufbauprinzip. All one word because that's that's how they do it in German. Um, and it just means we build from the bottom up. So this is our, go back to the analogy about the, the bookshelves from Wednesday. You, if you wanted to make that bookshelf as stable as possible, you start by putting the books at the bottom. If you started loading your bookshelf, your empty bookshelf, and you put all your books at the top, if there's an earthquake, that bookshelf's fallen over, right? If you want it to be as stable as possible, you put all the weight down low, and then you only start adding books in as you fill up the bottom shelves. That's all the off bow principle means. It just means that if you start adding electrons, you're going to start at the bottom. Um, and when I say the bottom, we usually write this as a one-dimensional function where we just have energy on the y-axis. And then we just represent the different states. That in, I don't mean states like energy levels this time. I mean the different possible ways we can have an electron get represented with a line or a box. And the lowest energy state is going to be furthest to the bottom, closest to the bottom. 
right? So if I was trying, if I had uh, n equals one and n equals two as my two possible energy levels, if I only have one electron, what's where's the most stable place I could put it? In n equals one. So it just means we put that electron in here. All right, and you might notice also that I'm, I'm going to start uh, using arrows to represent electrons. The direction that the arrow is pointing is somewhat arbitrary, but it's reflecting this last one called spin. Uh, if you have all electrons are either have either spin up or spin down. And again, they're not physically spinning, but it's sort of like a property. So it's, you can think of it like, like uh, a coin that's been flipped. It's either heads up or tails up, right? So in this case, if I draw an arrow like this with the arrow pointing upward, that means that, that electron is spin up. If I was going to add a second electron in the same system, remember each of our neighborhoods can hold two houses in it. As long as we're not trying to put both electrons into the same house, they can be in the same zip code. In other ways, that's my analogy, bad analogy way of saying Every, every line, every energy level that we're going to have can hold two electrons, one spin up, one spin down. You can never have the same energy level with, this, with an electron that has the same spin. You're not allowed to do that. That's just not the way the physical world behaves. Because they're spin up and spin down, they basically um, can avoid each other. And so even though the spin up electron is taking up space, it never sees the spin down electron. So B, anybody know what hot bunking is on a, on a submarine in the Navy? It's a term they use. With, they don't actually have enough beds on a submarine for everybody to sleep at the same time. Um, and so the lowest ranking people on a submarine have to hot bunk, which is basically when you get off shift, you go to your bed and you wake up the guy who's already sleeping there, and now he's on shift and you get to sleep. You can put two people into one bed in the Navy as long as only one person sleeps at a time. That's kind of the way that spin up and spin down work. They can exist in the same state, in the same energy, and in the same space as long as one spin up and one spin down. They don't see each other when one spin up and one spin down. He has another, another analogy. If you had a roommate that works night shift and you work day shift, doesn't really, do you really have that roommate? Do you really ever interact with that roommate? Very little, probably, right? Because when you're asleep, they're awake, and when you're awake, they're asleep. That's the way these spin up and spin down electrons work. Um, the poly exclusion principle, so Wolfgang Poly also. Um, where are my sci-fi fans in here? Anybody read sci-fi or may heard of the, no, sorry, it's the Fermi paradox. I mixed up Fermi and Polly. Uh, they're both from Northern Italy. I guess Polly might be Swiss now that I think about it. Um, Polly was basically said that you can, you can't have two electrons with the same address with the same set of quantum numbers. So if we we're going to add a third electron here, where would it have to go? Two. Into n equals two. And this is why the Bohr model starts to fall apart because the Bohr model says that it's basically ignoring these three rule or these three parts of the address. The Bohr model just says that you have energy levels, n equals one, n equals two. And that works as long as you're only dealing with hydrogen. Those other types of orbitals are actually slightly higher in energy. So we wouldn't actually just, as soon as we have a second electron in here, we don't just say n equals 1 and n equals 2. We say that this is in the first energy level, and it's an S-type orbital. This is the second energy level, and it's an S-type orbital. 
The thing is, every time you go up to a new energy level, you add a new type of orbital, which is actually why the periodic table is shaped the way it is. Where's the first row of the periodic table can hold how many electrons? Two, right? You got hydrogen and helium. That corresponds to the n equals one to the lowest energy level. As soon as you fill up n equals one, you go to the second energy level. How many electrons can go to the second energy level? Eight, but they're in two groups, right? I heard six and then I heard eight. Why did you say six? Who said six? Sorry, I won't tell you. What, why did you say six? Um, two and then six. They're all in the second row of the periodic table. So they're all, they all have the principal quantum number of two. They're all in the second energy level, but there's two types of orbitals in the second energy level. There's an S type and a P type. And so these first two columns on the periodic table, we actually call them the S block. Because when you, if you follow along counting and adding electrons into different energy levels, you basically just follow by counting along with the atomic number. You say one and then two, and then you fill the first energy level. And now you're on the second row of the periodic table, so you're in N equals two energy level. And you're, if you're in S block for your first two electrons for three and four, <laughs> that's that second line on the board there. That second energy level has an S orbital, and then these six columns are the P block. So you add electrons into the 2S and then into the 2P. And after you fill up the 2P, so let's see, I could say I kept going here. If I had this many electrons and I wanted to add one more, if you're looking at the periodic table, what would you expect to happen? What energy level is it going to go in? Three, and following on the periodic table, where is, where is element number 11? What block is it in? S. So it's a 3S orbital. And then after you fill up the 3S, where do the electrons go? We're, we jump across that big empty gap on the periodic table over to the P block again. And we start putting electrons in here. All right, so understanding the order of the orbitals can be a little bit tricky. But if you remember that the periodic table has the shape it does because of the order of the orbitals, it actually, the periodic table is all you need to remember how, what order these going when we're filling them up. Right, you start in the first row and in the S block, so you've got a 1S. Then you go to the second row in the, in the S block, second row in the P block. And we can, we don't even have to remember, we don't even have to memorize how many types of orbital or how many suborbitals are in each orbital type, because that's on the periodic table too. How many elements across is the P block? Six. That means you can put a total of six electrons into a P orbital, which means there has to be three lines, and each line can hold one up and one down. So the transition metals, so we're starting at scandium and going to zinc is the first one. That's what you get when you go to the third energy level. So the third energy level has 3s, and then it has 3p. When 3p is filled up, there's one more energy level called a d orbital. How many elements across is the, are the transition metals there? Scandium to zinc. That's your total. Just in for the transition metals, though, there's 10 across, right? So how many lines should I draw for the 3D? Five. Five lines, each one holds two electrons. 
One, two, three, four, five. The thing is, is that that D orbital doesn't show up until after something else. If you build up the three P and you're following along on the periodic table, what shows up next? So filling the three P, this many electrons, this, the state that I have drawn up here right now, what element does that correspond to? How many electrons do we have? Total of 18, which makes it what element to four neutrals? Argon. So if we wanted to add one more electron, if we're following along with the periodic table, we add one more electron, now we're in the fourth row of the periodic table, right? So what type of, of orbitals are we going to put it in? Or what orbital? The 4s. But... I, we just talked about how when we went to the third energy level, we added a d orbital. So our 3d is actually slightly higher in energy than the 4s. And since the first rule of filling these, these electron configurations up was start from the bottom and go upward, we actually put electrons into the 4s before we start putting them into the, the 3D orbital. So this is the one place where, one of two places where following along the periodic table, the way it's usually drawn, doesn't give you the full story. Because you have to know that, okay, it's in the fourth row, but that first D orbital actually belongs to N equals three. Going back to the, um, to the guitar analogy. Switching energy levels is like switching strings. Switching orbital types is like adding those harmonics in. And there's a point where the higher energy harmonic is actually a higher pitch than just going to the next string down. So you can get to a higher energy state, but still be on the third string. And, and doing the open, the open string vibration on the fourth string is actually lower in pitch than the third harmonic on the third string, which again, if you're not musical, that's okay. If you didn't follow that analogy, just know that there's just a, a slight disconnect. That third, that first D orbital corresponds to the N equals three energy level, even though it shows up in the fourth row of the periodic table. In other words, your D block is just going to be offset by one row from where it should be, according to the, to the energy levels. I'd ask if that makes sense, but that is the wrong question when we're learning quantum mechanics for the first time. Um, so instead, I'll say, do you follow what I'm saying with those? Okay. So the other thing... I had said this once, every time we go up another energy level, we add a new, a new type of orbital. So you can think of it as N equals zero has no orbital types. It can't hold any electrons. When you go from zero to one, we add an S orbital. When you go from one to two, we add a P orbital. When you go from two to three, we add a D orbital. I know eventually there's an S orbital, but you can see where that is in the way it's that's exactly where we're going with that. So going from two to three, we added a D orbital, but we filled up 4S before we got to the first D orbital. When you go from three to four, you add an F orbital. So N equals four has four types of orbitals. You, N equals four has a 4S, a 4P, a 4D, and a 4F. The F orbital are those bottom two rows. You may have, may have wondered in the past why they're drawn down here, but then there's this weird little like, but insert them here. Because basically these bottom two rows actually go in rows six and seven. But that doesn't print out on a, on a piece of paper as nicely. You need it to be widescreen in order to fit that. 
but the actual shape of the periodic table, called the wide form periodic table, excuse me, <clears throat> see if I have that, looks like this. So 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 3d, but we don't fill that up until after 4s. After 3d, we go back to 4p, 5s. Then we I remember our d block is offset by one row. So 4d, 5p, 6s, and then we get to 57 to 71. The f block elements belong to n equals four. So the f block is offset by two rows, the same way that the d block is offset by one row. The f block is offset by two rows. All right, and so if you can remember those those two tricks, the d block's offset by one, f block's offset by two, then we actually, we know the order of these orbitals already. We don't need to memorize it because the periodic table won't let you down. Now, you may have seen those like you write them out like this and then you draw diagonal lines. Has anybody seen this before? Yeah. These work. And you'll notice that it just goes up 4s, 4p, 4d, 4f. And you'll notice it gets one orbital type wider every every row, right? This is not a bad way to remember how to do this. Um, thing is, it's really easy to miss to write this the wrong way or not remember how to fill it in the right way. And like I mentioned before, now that you've taken the elements quiz, I'm never going to take your periodic table away from you again. So if you have your periodic table, you don't need to remember how to do this. If you've already learned this way of doing it and you feel really comfortable using it, by all means. But the very first thing when I give you your midterm is you stop, you sit down and you write this out and use, use that to figure out your electron configurations. You do you. I don't like it because I never learned it when I was first learning this. I just learned to use the periodic table. So to me, that makes more sense. Right? Um, the F block has 15 elements wide. So how many slots do you have? The rest goes by by two, right? Correct. Is it actually 15 wide, though? Yeah. No, it's 12. Because the spot on the periodic table where you're supposed to insert it is one of these slots. So basically, Utichum and Lorentzium go in the D block. So, Lanthanum through Ytterbium are the F block. So how many lines do you draw per F block then if there's 14 across? Seven. Seven. The other thing you might be noticing if you're if you're mathematically inclined, if your if your mind thinks in terms of patterns, in an S in an S orbital, you can fit two electrons. Or the other way to think about it is you can you have one slot. P orbitals have three. D orbitals have five. F orbitals have seven. How many would a G orbital have? Nine. It goes up by odd integers for the number of slots. So in a G orbital, you would actually be able to fit 18 electrons. However, you might, you might notice there's no D block or G block on the periodic table because the first energy level that has a G orbital is the fifth energy level. And those electrons are so high in energy, we've never observed the G orbital in nature. We can't make any elements big enough that, they, that the G orbital actually comes into play. So for the most part, F orbital is where it stops. There's, uh, there's more in theory. It's to go back to the guitar string analogy. So there's harmonics that are so, where the wavelength is so short, that the pitch, you can't hear the pitch because it's outside of our, our hearing range. That doesn't mean that harmonics don't exist, just that we don't 
they don't matter when it comes to music. Right, so the G orbitals exist mathematically and we can show evidence that they exist, but we never observe them on the periodic table. So there's, that's why there's no G block on the periodic table. And then in theory, mathematic math like series that go to infinity, right? So there's a G block and they just start going alphabetical from there. There's a theoretical H block, um, but they start getting more and more theoretical and less and less actually observable in the real world, the higher energy you go. All right, one last thing about filling these energy levels in. If we're, when we start adding electrons into P or E orbitals, where there's multiple possible states that are the same energy, we call those degenerate states. Degenerate in, in physics terms just means the same energy. All three of these have the same energy. So there's not really any advantage to making them pair up, making the electrons pair up before we put one electron into each of them. If, if all three of these are the same energy, then why we wouldn't really start filling them in like this. It's a, the analogy that I use is getting on a on a bus with a bunch of if you have a bunch of strangers getting on a bus or on an airplane, everybody takes a, a row that's empty before they start pairing up. Right? Nobody sits two to a row before they have to. A bunch of strangers. Maybe that's just my antisocial tendencies, but nobody would would willingly sit by a stranger when there's still an empty seat, right? Is that unreasonable? So, in the way that the electrons behave with that is, it just means that if I was going to add three electrons in here, I'd put one electron into each of them before I start doubling up. And we'd have, they would all have the same spin. Um, it doesn't matter if it's spin up or spin down as long as it's the same, which is mathematically, that's something called exchange energy that causes that. It's slightly lower in energy to have them all exactly halfway filled with, these, with the same spin. And interestingly enough, that's what causes magnetism. Magnetism occurs when you have a bunch of unpaired electrons with the same spin. When you have unpaired electron, it, it generates a slight magnetic field. And when all, when all of the unpaired electrons have their magnetic field pointed in the same orientation, it creates, it creates a macroscopic magnetic field. So a magnet like you stick to your refrigerator just has is a metal or a alloy where you've got a bunch of unpaired electrons that all have the same spin and the atoms are all aligned the same way too. Good. And that's why most of the strongest magnets are down here in the F block or in the lower D block. These metals down here make better magnets because having an F orbital partially filled means you can have more electrons with the same spin before you have to start pairing them up. But we can see if oxygen actually has a magnetic field. Uh, if you have liquid oxygen, you can take liquid oxygen. If you pour it through the poles of a magnet, you can actually see it, the stream of liquid oxygen bending against gravity, which is weird. So we could actually physically prove that oxygen has a magnetic field that because it has these unpaired electrons. And you can see it. It's one of the only, it's, there are very, very few magnetic liquids especially at room temperature. If you try to do the same thing with liquid nitrogen, it doesn't work because liquid nitrogen doesn't have the same, um, the unpaired electrons. The electron configuration is different for nitrogen than it is for oxygen. All right, so how do we actually use this? What, why is this useful to us? Well, I just gave you a macroscopic example of why understanding how unpaired electrons work can actually affect their physical properties, right? So if you're going into something like engineering or physics where you're studying macroscopic properties, understanding their electronic properties is the first step to that. And this is still just an approximation. 
we'll take this and if you keep taking more and more chemistry, you'll learn how wrong this is as soon as you get past your past gen chem, basically. Um, when you get to talking about organic chemistry and orbital hybridization and things like, which we'll actually will touch on in this class even. So even this isn't the full story, but if we're laying the groundwork for being able to understand how electrons and therefore materials work. So if we want to write the electron configuration of carbon, all that really means is take the number of electrons that carbon has and start filling in the orbitals until you run out of electrons. So how many electrons does carbon have when it's neutral? How many? Carbon's got, carbon 14 exists, but it only has six electrons. Um, so if we're starting at the lowest possible energy state, all we're going to do is add electrons in from the bottom up until we run out of electrons. So add six electrons. One, two, four electrons left. Three, four, two electrons left. Five, six. So every drawing this out every time you have an atom you want to describe though, takes up a lot of space. And it's not actually the fastest way. Once you understand why these rules work and how we fill them in, the shorthand way of doing this is you just say how many orbitals and how many electrons in each orbital. So you just say the shorthand way of writing this would be 1s, and we say 1s has two electrons. So we write it like it's squared, but it's not mathematically squared. That's just a um, kind of like charge. It's a way of saying there's two electrons in the 1s orbital. Don't try to square anything. We're not doing math with this. After we filled up the 1s, we put electrons into the 2s. And it, we fit two of them in there. So what's the next one? 2p and how many electrons? Two. It can fit six, but we don't have six to put in there. This is the shorthand for this. Are you? So it turns out that orbitals in general are most stable when they're either completely filled or completely empty. So what that does is it allows us to predict how many electrons an element wants to gain or lose in order to become most stable. And you'll notice all of the elements that already have all of their orbitals filled or empty are column 18 are the noble gases. They're called the noble gases because they don't react with anything. Um, and so that's because they already have the right electron configuration to make everything stable. So what would the electron configuration look like for argon? What would the shorthand be? Attention students, the Sphere Art Club meeting is canceled for today. Again, the Sphere Art Club meeting is canceled for today. So for argon, our electron configuration, they always start the same. They're always going to start 1s. And everything is going to be 1s2. The only element that will ever be 1s1 would be what? Hydrogen. So anything larger than hydrogen always starts with 1s2. Then 2s2. 2p6. Then what? 3s2. 3p6. And then we're going to keep going. So argon stops there. So this is exactly what I mean. All you really need to know how to do to write these is follow along on the periodic table. Know what those blocks are and know how to count the rows. And you don't need to be able to draw this every time. I guess kind of building on that, isn't there like, let's say you were doing it for like, all of these plus this. Correct. So in the way that we'll do it for this class is if there's 18 electrons or fewer, I want you to write out 
the entire configuration. So everything from argon and, and lower, I want you to write out the whole configuration. But there's shortcut when you get bigger than argon um, is basically you go to the last noble gas, basically the end of the, the previous row. And you can use that and you just put it in brackets. So like if I was going to do Krypton, the electron configuration for Krypton, if I was writing out the whole thing, the complete structure would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6. But everything from here back is the same for everything on that same row, right? Everything in the fourth row has the same first 18 electrons. So the shorthand for writing that is to say, okay, Krypton's electron configuration, and then in brackets, you write the noble gas from the previous row. And then you start with 4s2, 3d10, 4p6. So for anything with more than 18 electrons, you're allowed to use this as your shortcut. For eight, and if, but if I ever say complete, that means I don't want to see the, the abbreviation. Complete means I want the whole thing, usually because on a test, I want to make sure you remember how the first couple rows go. But usually on a test also, I'll give you a couple that are 18 or fewer electrons, and then I'll give you one or two that are past that, where you get to use the abbreviation. So, right, so demonstrate you know how to do the first couple rows, and then I'll let you use the shortcut. Connor? Would it be wrong to just write Krypton? For Krypton? It, it would be for this class. Okay. It's That's a little bit like defining a term by using the term. Yeah. Um, the other the other thing I will say, the other common question I get, last thing, I know we're almost out of time, is some textbooks will have you put all of the same um, same energy level together. So instead of writing 3P6, 4S2, 3D10, they'll have you put the 3D10 over here and the 4S after that. I don't like that because that's not the way the periodic table goes. It's not technically wrong though. So I won't make it make a big deal over if you said 3D10, 4S2, 4P6 means the same thing. I just don't like it because that's not the way that the, old, the periodic table goes. That's a bigger question than we have time for. So ask okay. that on the quiz or on Monday. All right. Actually, no quiz this week. You guys already took a quiz. <laughs> Hey, no problem. Have a good one. You too. Oh, hey, doing, Jesse? Doing pretty well. Let me let me stop the recording real quick.